شكرا لحضوركم وشكرا واصف على وجودك معنا آه هذا اللقاء هو جزء من مشروع دارت الفنون الفني لتوثيق تداعيات الحرب على غزة بالتركيز على المشهد الفني والثقافي وحملات الإسكات والترهيب للأصوات المتضامنة مع القضية الفلسطينية حول العالم بشكل المشروع امتدادا لبرنامجنا التضامني مع فلسطين اللي أطلقناه في نهاية شهر تشرين الأول الماضي وبتضمن عرض لأعمال عن فلسطين من مجموعة خالد شومان الخاصة بدأ المشروع بتركيب مبني على النصوص بعنوان لن نرحل للفنانة سوها شومان هون بالمختبر واستضفنا الفنانة إيميلي جاسر في جلسة نقاشية وعرض لفيلمها الأخير رسالة إلى صديق واليوم بسعدنا استضافة القيم الفني والكاتب واصف كورتن في لقاء بحمل عنوان كيف نصمد في مواجهة حالة القمع المسيطرة على المشهد الثقافي العالمي واصف كورتن هو منسق معارض وكاتب ومدرس للفنون البصرية ومؤسساتها وممارساتها المكانية شارك واصف في تنسيق بنالي تايبي في 2008 وبنالي اسطنبول الدولي التاسع في 2005 وكان أحد القيمين المشاركين في بنالي ساو باولو الرابع والعشرين في 1998 كما شغل واصف منصب المدير والقيم الرئيسي لبنالي اسطنبول الدولي الثالث في 92 وأسس وأدار قسم الأبحاث والبرامج في مؤسسة سولت هي مؤسسة ثقافية متعددة التخصصات في تركيا وحصل واصف على جائزة التميز في تقييم المعارض من كلية بارد ونشرت له العديد من الكتابات حول الفن المعاصر والوضع الثقافي في كتب ومطبوعات مختلفة وعمل محررا لعدد من الكتب ويشغل واصف حاليا منصب المستشار الفني والتنسيقي في متحف الفن العربي الحديث في الدوحة وهو عضو في مجلس إدارة مؤسسة سولت ومتحف الفن المعاصر في أنتور بتضمن المشروع عدة فعاليات وبرامج ولقاءات وورش عمل سيعلن عنها خلال الفترة القادمة واللي بتساهم في إثراء البعد التوثيقي للمشروع Thank you all for joining us Thank you Wasif for being with us today So this talk is part of Darat al-Funu's archival art project that documents the war on Gaza and on the arts and culture and the ongoing silencing campaigns against those who speak out in solidarity with Palestine. The project runs alongside with our In Solidarity with Palestine program that began at the end of October 2023, featuring works on display from the Khalid Shoman collection. We started this archival art project with a text-based installation titled We Won't Leave by artist Suha Shoman here uh, at the lab. On Thursday, artist Emily Jasser uh, screened and discussed her latest film, Letter to a Friend. And today we, wel we welcome curator and writer Wasif Korten in a talk titled How to Survive When Everything is the Culture War Today. Wasif Colton is a curator, writer, and teacher of visual art, its institutions, and spatial practices. Colton co-curated the Taipei Binali in uh, 2008, the Ninth International Istanbul Binali in 2005, and was one of the co-curators of the 24th Sao Paulo Binali in 1998. He was the director and chief curator of the Third International Istanbul Binali in 1992. Corton was the founding director of research and programs of SALT, an interdisciplinary cultural institution based in Turkey. Corton is a recipient of the award for curatorial excellence from Bard College, and he has edited and written extensively on contemporary art and the cultural situation for books and other publications. He is a research and curatorial advisor to Methaf at a Museum of Modern Art in Doha and serves on the board of the Foundation for Art Initiative SALT and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp. 
The project will unfold with more events, talks, workshops to be announced soon that will continue to contribute to this archival project. Wasif, the floor is yours. Come on. Oh. I thank you so much. It's uh, it's kind of funny to hide behind <laughs> past stuff, you know. Um, thank you for these fantastic days in Amman to the Venerable Soha Shoman, whom I have admired for many years and who sets an example for many of us with her integrity, dedication, and high standards. I'm grateful to Luma Hamdan and Ahmed Amin for their gracious hospitality friendship, kindness, and also organizational skills. It's with great regret that I have not been in Amman for 25 years. During this time, Bharat al Fanun has incrementally developed into an outstanding institution for the city and the region. I was also delighted to visit the National Gallery in its renovated new quarters and careful and deliberate expansion. And thanks to Farid Reis, who was kind enough to give a grand tour on Juman Mubarak, and finally to Paula Ferran at MMAG for the inspiring visit. And Rana Beiruti guided us through her thoughtful exhibition there. There's good reason to be proud of this change that blossomed slowly and deliberately instead of, a, instead of plucking a colossal, top-down, heavy institution that does not nurture and that does not serve the community, but acts as a mere tourist attraction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to go to that side. Yeah. It's humbling to be speaking here in the lab, in the place and context of this in solidarity with Palestine program. We've been receiving gut-wrenching articles, texts, testimonials, testimonials since October 7, and I cannot add more. Instead, I will broadly outline the context that got us here from the juncture of culture and its institutions. Even if we are going through Nakba of 76 years, as Armenians also called it Akhad, or the same meaning, now we have to take into account the fact of the global far right in which time this is all played out. In the face of catastrophic blitzkriegs that plague our future and our will to live together, the art world has taken center stage in cancellations. From the whirlwind of postponements of Documenta, the Berlin Biennial, Istanbul Biennial, to cancellations of exhibitions and projects, by Emily Jassir, Samia Halabi, and many, many, many others in West Europe, the United States, and Canada. The art world has been at the center of daily news. Why is that? Why do other cultural expressions and fields, except for literature perhaps, and cinema certainly, do not have the same repercussions? And says literature, we know it's a, solidar in a solitary activity that comes out of individual conviction, but with public resonance. Now, let's underscore a few facts. Art institutions are the last front of public space. The educational institutions, for example, have given up that kind of authority. The crisis is not only in politics and higher education, it also risks the credibility and survival of art institutions. Funders and political inclinations are the only factors driving their operations, not the public interest. If we lose the art world, we'll have no public sphere left. Tonight's conversation comes from 35 years of personal experience, individual experience in the art world. I ran institutions for over half of that span and inevitably ran, in, ran, in, ran into troubles of sorts with authorities, Force faced populist, populist backlashes and even two farcical court cases. But my experience pales when compared to the tribulations of my colleagues today. 
Today, even the most innocuous exhibitions like the Sami Halabi retrospective can get cancelled without an explanation. As we have all witnessed, the cancellations have happened to a long and decorated list of extremely competent professionals. These are not the kinds of artists or curators who merely want to shock audiences or gain notoriety. We cannot imagine how such appalling events impact exhibition makers and institutions and how enslaved their horizons have become. What does that mean for artists who identify with the just cause of Palestine and more broadly Arab and Islamic aid geographies? How are artists, curators, and writers being canceled behind closed doors and taken off checklists that we'll never know about? What does it mean to subject the exhibitions to sensitivity reviews? An atmosphere of fear and self-censorship, fear that your funding can get cut, fear that one, you would lose your job, results in cancellations before projects are even planned. This means history. Power does not only wipe you out, but it also erases your traces. In my practice, I've tried to figure out ways to embed institutions in social change and not close them to matters that include society. This is what art institutions are for. We pose questions through exhibitions, programs, research, and scholarships about issues critical to our communities. We are not above society. We are not in the business of preaching. We must not infantilize or seduce our audiences. Our autonomy is essential. Our job is to initiate a public discussion, hoping that the debate will benefit how our users and constituents think. When we engage with historical subjects, we do not just talk about the past. We take on historical projects to look at today and help change the past in the present. Otherwise, what is history's value if we treat it as a frozen, immutable block? Please note again that it was never my intention or policy to shock audiences or talk down to them. I find that shocking audiences is an avant-garde gesture that I doubt has any meaningful value for institutional practice. And I really think that shocking audiences are merely Western entitlements from a particular, that come from a particular history of modernity, accompanied by a cult of arrogance and individualism and machismo. We may have to deal with the most disturbing subjects, but it must be done carefully. I move with the fundamental belief that it's essential to circumvent antagonism and unproductive controversy. We must create a context that allows us to deal with complex subjects beyond finger pointing. An institution that contributes to the atomization and fragmentation of the public it serves may need to do things differently. We do not push our opinions down people's throats. We present discussions, help people form opinions or think differently than before. Because we are the last front in the public sphere. Our spaces are public and we must take care of them with that sense of duty. We must also keep some things away from the public to protect ideas, discussions, and fermentations from the gaze of power and populism. We have to establish a safe space where discourse and research can flourish. Now, my strategy was to present the exhibitions in a manner that does not close the argument, but opens it, presents the facts and conditions, and leaves it to the audience to decide. So the idea was to avoid pushing the audience away, but to engage them. This also means that we're responsible for speaking beyond our devoted followers. We have to develop ways to talk with those who may disagree with us. And communicating with people who feel out, left out of culture for many reasons. It could be reasons of class, reasons of uh, cultural history, etc will not be always be successful because power is becoming more disdainful, more bigoted, and entitled to act on behalf of populist impulses. And it can do so because there's little standing in the way. 
I hope to claim that our catastrophic conditions did not start a few months ago. It has been making in them for many years. With the rise of the far right, crony capitalism and kleptocracy. The same pundits are also behind the climate crisis and the global war. We must be organized as a swarm and a community to stop it. We also have to learn how to change our lives. We have to learn from the failure of the international brigades during the Spanish Civil War. That internationalism is essential, but not in its existing forms today. When I was in graduate school in the 1980s in the USA, we lived through the culture wars during the Reagan-Bush era. Police even raided and shut down exhibitions such as the Robert Maplethorpe exhibition at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. And I recall John Frommeyer, the director of the National Endowment for the Arts, speaking against his critics after he was fired. I had cut out and tacked his opinion piece in the newspaper on my office wall. It simply said, arts are speech, they must be protected. In short, as he spoke, it, and I quote, it was, na it was about the nature of tolerance, the nature of community in society, and the willingness of people to encounter differences. Now, this era ushered in around the world the lifting of the 80s, I mean, the regulatory bodies and the privatization of culture internationally. And all this sounds somewhat naive and innocent now, at a time when a plutocracy regulates the art world. So the highway to our conditions was laid years ago in the 1990s. The beginning of the 1990s saw the end of history, foreclosing all possibilities. It meant that capitalism as a global order was forever. The author, Douglas Cop Copland, wrote, In 1992, Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history, and everyone believed it. The 80s, whatever they were, were over, and we were collectively entered what felt like a blank sheet of white paper. Really? But the end of, his the end of history has been over for a while. The idea that Western liberal democracy was the final form of human government has been exposed as the old order crumbles. Anti-politics threaten political establishments across the world. We could have expected that this crisis would pave the way for a different future. But is a new world waiting to be born? The climate crisis has intensified that problem of temporality an end of history comes crashing against the humanity. The future has become harder to imagine. The middle class politics of culturalism, horizontalism, and moralizing dominate the left. Even if they are correct, nobody wants to hear them. After Fukuyama declared the end of history, politics sank into decline. Managerial elites all back democratic powers and participation, and trade unions and party memberships crumbled. Nihilism and consumerism took over popular culture. But the 2008 global financial crisis brought all of this to an end, pushing millions into poverty, unemployment, and calling into question the legitimacy of the neoliberal order, which has ever since been in a process of breakdown. Now, the failure to reform economies or political systems or punish wrongdoers in 2018 contribu 2008, contributed to a new anti-politics, a sense that all politicians are, and politics are corrupt and hostile to public interests. And this resulted in populist movements. It coincided with, with a new tendency on the left toward middle-class radicalism removed from working-class culture, concerned instead only with identity politics and culturalism. These definitions became clearer when contrasted with their opposites. The end of history came about when the Soviet Union collapsed, and the struggle ended between competing ideological systems over the best means of organizing human society. 
Now, neoliberal capitalism became the new norm as control of economies was captured by banks and multinationals and management of politics came under technocratic centrist politics, followed by an era of, depo of, by an era of depolitization and fascism. Now, back to the 1990s. Lest we forget, 1995 saw Umprofors heavily armed, 400 Dutch peacekeepers watch as Serbian forces massacred 8,000 Bosnian civilians in the United Nations designated safe area of Srebrenica in the former Yugoslavia. The world also watched the genocidal killing of nearly 800,000 Tutsis by the Hutu in Rwanda in 1994. But we cannot count what is not countable. Lives are not numbers. But this was already an ominous sign. Unlike the genocide in Rwanda, Srebrenica was in the heart of Europe. It took place in the so-called never again land. This was on the continent that decided for once and for all to put an end to its wars, first through the integration of its coal and steel industries into a single supranational market so that there, so that could avoid the war, and a market that ultimately led to the European Union, first through its economies and finally through the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, which culturalized it. This is paradoxically around the same time when post-secularism post started to become visible, with a clear and conspicuous link to the fascist of countries like Austria, Belgium, Germany, Hungary and Poland. In many respects, all these singular events, fiction and non-fiction, things that we look to as singular or specific events, such as the balkanization of South Europe, appear from a distance as the roots of what got us here today. However, the promise of 1989 was different. It was understood as an end to all conflicts and the dawn of post-history. But 1989 was also the bicentennial of the French Revolution, that is the end of Enlightenment ideology, the year the World Wide, World Wide Web was born, and the year Berlin Wall came down. So the 1990s were supposed to be a white paper, a clean slate. Life under capitalism had taken full traction, and it was the end of President Mitterrand's reign in France, and the beginning of the days of Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, the two who followed exactly Reagan and Thatcher's script, but with a smile and went on demolishing the welfare state. Their supposed third way provided a shot in the arm for neoliberalism. As historical social democracy was dwindling, so were the forms of social organization and identity formation around labor practice. Classes were still there, but their collective conscience began to disappear. We were becoming lonely and singular on our own and feeling shameful for not succeeding in having a decent life. Blame the wrong subjects, the refugees, the immigrants, people of color, people of different ethnicities, gender, and all the rest. A new actor was to uphold social policies in place of tra trade unions and social organizations. Non-governmental organizations and civil society took the lead. Civil society had a central role in public life that does not include government activities. It embodied institutions and organizations, each expressing its own common purpose through ideas, actions, and demands on governments. So civil society included individuals, but also religious organizations, academic institutions, issue focus groups, not-for-profits, and NGOs. In short, our social was, life was atomized. More on that later. Now, at the time, the art world could not be bothered. The art world looked hopeful. We could not be bothered because the floodgates had opened. Horizontalism was taking root. To be an artist, you no longer had to be from the Germany, the UK, or the USA. There were new agencies, like biennials, that you could participate in with people like yourself. Here was a new generation with similar issues, 
a parallel world was in formation. The 1980s work on multiculturalism, publications like Third Text, and the subaltern movements opened the conversation in the old centers. From Magician de la Terre to the Decade Show, the terra firma of the art world was globalizing. In 1990, a conference called Expanding Internationalism was held during the Venice Pioneer, and the keynote speech was given by Homi Baba, where the American museums, bar none, confessed to their total ignorance of the large parts of the world, and also confessed that they did not have the tools or the intellectual capacity to deal with it. 1992, the Institute of International Visual Arts, INIVA, opened in London to, uh, to address an imbalance in how cultural diverse artists and creators were represented in the United Kingdom. And Professor Stuart Hall presided over it. Shoros Centers for Contemporary Arts were remarkably active in East Europe between 1991 and 1995. Goldsmith's curatorial course began accepting students in 1993, along with Bard College's Center for Curatorial Studies, instituting a different agency beyond the non-institutionalized art world. There were many miracles and brilliance. Brilliant was the name of the exhibition at the Walker Arts Center in 1994 on young British art. The next, next time this market phenomenon was exhibited, it was called sensation. The art world was moving concurrently in two directions. We could have projects like the short century, independence and liberation moments in Africa, 1945-1994, at Tate Modern, global conceptualism at Quiz Museum Art in 1999, projects like Cities on the Move or After the Wall project at the Moderna Museet in Stockholm. So you could have Okwi Envisor's Johannesburg Biennial in 1997 and Paolo Herkinov's Sao Paulo Biennial in 1998, which ended dominant narratives. But we also had sensation. Sensation exhibition, for example, was used almost auction wall for an upcoming auction. And David Bowie narrated the exhibition for the acoustic guides. So what happened to that coexistence became another story in two in 2000s. There were, then there was Nordic miracle, the Tirana miracle, Nordic miracles, signaling high expectations of integration in a new art context and its institutions. And a new class of intrepid curators from Oslo to Johannesburg, China to Canada, led many nations to aid to await integration into parallel histories eagerly. At the time, we overlooked the origins of a post-secular society emerging in the ethnic and religious politics of Europe. That this new ecosystem of the rise of the NGOs, culture-based activism, was just not the way to go. With a decade of rising curators, exhibitions, biennials, and the scholarship, we built a new contemporary art world. And then the 2000s saw the cool down of the biennials, their replacement by art fairs and financialization, and the leveraging of art into an asset class. This was followed by mega musealization in the two to 2010s, the Saadiat Island, the West Kowloon neighborhood in, in Hong Kong, the unsuccessful Holland Island in St. Petersburg, and generally the expansion of Bilbao syndrome, and many new Tates and many new Pompidou's. In the 2020s, now we now live in wreckage under the global war. We exist simultaneously in the false hopes of a period in the multiplication of narratives, a post-linear history, and a revaluation of history. What was the general terrain looking like before October 7? As we have experienced in India, Russia, China, Nicaragua, Turkey, and other countries, increasing go increasingly, governments were seeking to block foreign support for cultural institutions. The foreign agent law was adopted in Hungary, Israel, Egypt, Russia, Cambodia, Uganda, Nicaragua, and other countries in the last decade. 
It goes without saying that in most of these countries, there are no public funds for existing cultural exploration. By public ones, funds, I mean state funds. And these are generally transferred to activities that use populist and archaeological methods, revivalist historical manipulations, fake fabrications, and fictional nationalist narratives. The private sector also withdraws its support from urgent and living cultural expressions. Businesses fear the cancellations of government contracts and the reaction of the tyranny of regimes. Sometimes city support may continue due to political difference between, um, between main city administrations and the central government of those countries. For example, the opposition mayor ma mayors of Warsaw, Zagreb, Budapest in East Europe are in the hands of civil platforms and the Greens. They provide shelter for cultural institutions. But even when city governments are not a hindrance, that's good for us. Now, in 2012, Israel's parliament passed the law requiring NGOs that receive more than half of their support from outside the country including European Union funds to report on their use of. This legislation was designed to target the NGOs fighting for the rights of Palestinians. Israel did not use that law for NGOs supporting right-wing settlers. And they do not, the right-wing settlers do not disclose their external funding sources. The foreign agent law was also implemented in Russia to inhibit the activities of NGOs. This law renders international NGO networks dysfunctional and makes resource mobilization impossible. According to the laws, NGOs cannot engage in political activities. However, giving a clear legal definition of political activity is not possible. This ambiguity leads to manipulation of the law and prosecution of the targeted NGOs. The law in Russia defines political activity as influencing public opinion and public policy. Most, NGOs active, most NGO activities include science, culture, arts, health services, support for the disabled, physical education, sports, ecology, and philanthropy. Many NGOs raise public awareness, shape public opinion, and organize conferences, workshops, and programs to discuss public policy options. Thus, the scope of the law includes many NGOs that do not engage in overt political activities. At the end of the day, since the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has had no contemporary art. The most prominent institutions, such as Garage, remain close to the public. And all the initiatives have either closed down or, mo or moved outside the country to Armenia and other ex-Eastern Soviet states. The NGO law in China has been part of a series of measures that began in 2013 to discredit and silence non-governmental organizations that seek to hold the government accountable to its obligations regarding corruption, ecology, fundamental rights, democracy, and just rule. According to Chinese social media and journalists, soft powers in the U.S. fueled by NGOs are spread among China, China's government bodies, academies, and institutions of higher education. China sees NGOs such as the Ford Foundation promoting U.S.'s global hegemony. They argue that American NGOs use their connection with Chinese universities, the Academy of Social Sciences, and other research institutions to develop relationships with Chinese scientists. These people are regarded as America's spokespeople in China, misleading people about socialist economic policy and undermines, undermining the ideological integrity, integrity of the party. As for the United States, just three years ago, Newt Gingrich, a leading hawk of the Republican Party, gave an interview in which he said, I quote, Hollywood and the majority of the political elite 
are components of a powerful system that controls cultural institutions, institutions that impose a radical far-left agenda on the American people. That's Hollywood. In this environment, many Republicans and conservatives feel powerless, even helpless, for good reason. And Gingrich continues, there's a political and cultural machine that prunes their objections. The situation regarding civil society organization is not very different in Turkey, where I'm from. Now, the ratio of NGOs to the population is higher in countries with established democratic traditions. For example, trade union membership is 49% in Sweden. And membership in, in any humanitarian or charitable organization is 29%. In Egypt, trade union membership is three persons per thousand. And membership in any humanitarian charitable organization is five person per thousand. Turkey is, of course, among the countries with a low membership to population ratio, with NGO membership standing around 5%, which is 10 times that of Egypt, but one tenth of Sweden. So, why is membership in NGO so low? Studies show various reasons. I think you can guess them, but they may list them anyhow. The critical point is that people do not consider civil society as an essential part of our coexistence. Therefore, becoming a member of an NGO and participating in the democracy is not an option. Secondly, a civic significant portion of the public does not believe that people can become NGO members because they hesitate and fear. They are even convinced that NGOs cannot act independently of the governments. In other words, a large part of society thinks that NGOs are afraid of the government. Finally, people that believe NGOs do not critically influence politics or policy making. So we have a situation where NGOs are useless and labor does not exist. So NGOs, such as associations and foundations, established or patronized by the state and religious institutions are in vogue, although they are not civil society organizations. With rising post-neoliberalism, governments have entered the NGO universe. That's one of the characteristics of our post, uh, toxic post-neoliberal environment. In other words, states also impede the work of independent institutions by transferring funds to their front, uh, front NGOs, or NGOs that are aligned with the state, that are only on paper look like NGOs. So under such structural violence, institutions are often presented to the public as intermediaries or agents of foreign interests. Cultural institutions and art institutions, which in the past were perceived as cosmopolitan or international and often ignored, are now targeted. While all kinds of sensitivities, such as general morality, tradition, religion, national and local sensitivities that are endless, are expressed as red lines never to cross. At the same time, LGBTI plus rights, women's rights, the rights of the species, the rights to water, the rights to land are not included. So if the so-called agents of foreign interests are some, sometimes defined as internal enemies, political movements with an ideology that defines them as such are increasingly becoming a threat to minority society communities. And the arts and culture sector is a significant element of these minority communities. Now, the most striking feature here is that countries at copy and, and adopt control and policing mechanisms from each other and use similar approaches and even similar language. So the governments that claim to be the most patriotic on the contrary, follow shared models to keep pressure on cultural expressions. So it's the governments that are globalist. Such an eco ecosystem of ruling power 
works perfectly. They raise the bets. Whoever does an evil deed that has never been done before provides an example for the next one and gets repeated until it gets normalized. Repressive practices have become more and more normalized. Now, Egypt is one of the most obsessed countries with limiting foreign cultural interventions. But on the other hand, the biggest recipients of foreign funds in Egypt is the Egyptian government and the army. It receives $1.3 billion in aid from the United States, and the government controls a business empire that accounts to 25 to 40 percent of its economy. And they produce everything from mineral water to missiles. So if you're talking about foreign conspiracies, collaborations, conflicts of interest, who are we talking about? And what was the threat of townhouse gallery or contemporary image collecting in Cairo to be two, two institutions we owe a lot to? There are also different reasons why particular individuals and institutions of the cultur cultural and artistic ecology attract the attention of governments. Because the professional class in institutions, not all of them, consists more of more public intellectuals than in the past. We speak and exercise our public roles. Now, public spaces are becoming more scarce, and the pressure on universities, as all you know, as you know from recent months, is intense. They are no longer protected and have to adapt to a company-customer relationship shaping cultural institutions. At the same time, many small-scale art institutions are increasingly interested in expanded definitions of art. Their programs are not limited to exhibitions. They address an enormous discursive need and provide respite. They engage in practices that cut across every field, from climate crisis to gentrification. Therefore, institutions from different backgrounds and those who are working there are much more open-minded than classical institutions, and they enrich our lives. Let's talk about the ecosystem. The cultural sector is divided in two, but I'm not talking about branches growing from the same root or from the same, yeah, or diver diverting from the same roots. This is not the case in terms of its ecology. One side is predicated on the history of industrial fairs and exhibition mechanisms. These are the large exhibitions, big art fairs, glossy museums, shiny programs, advertisements, tourist attractions, star architect buildings, and a feeling of free time. Opiates, in short. On the other hand, there are the startups, the autonomous, the independent, the experimental, and the restless spaces. They attempt to build communities and provide care and support for artists with a small footprint. So these are two different art worlds, independent of each other. You may think you are at the intersection of these, or you may collaborate with a, with a museum as an independent institution, but at the end of the day, you go your own way, and they go their own. It doesn't imply that you are not being used that when you collaborate with a big museum. These molecular institutions of the ecosystem operate in extraordinarily localized, isolated, and repressive environments, such as Darjasir in Bethlehem. Once perceived as havens, like institutions that were, place, were places to hide, feel safe, use and share resources, they're facing even more significant uncertainty due to context of funding, increasing restrictions from the government, and everything else. So it is necessary to create flexible strategies that allow adoption to change in contexts. And I don't know, I don't know what these are. There are no ready-made prescriptions. They vary from institution to institution, location to location. Each institution exists in a different context and answering different needs. Now, what we need is a glossary of experience, a glossary of experience of knowledge. Such a glossary requires international collaboration. How do different institutions in other places develop strategies? 
how they will learn from each other and from them across the global south. How do we think together? Where and how do we gather? We need to expand our horizons far beyond our usual neighborhood. For example, the last geography where valuable examples and recommendations for us would come from might be the Netherlands, Sweden, and the like. We have to leave aside the Central Western Euro-American corridor because it's no longer relevant to our ecology. For example, what could be the efforts to create our income locally? Because there has to be a limit to volunteerism and self-exploitation. Many people have devoted our, their lives to this, and they are tired. Second is the issue of resource, space, infrastructure, and capacity sharing. Is it possible to open spaces to different communities and programs and eliminate competition? How can we build a non-competitive cultural environment? Beyond artistry, as art associations, solidarity with other fields is also required. We need lawyers, we need NGOs, we need hybrid discussions. It's also helpful to blur the boundaries between who is supporting, who is supported, who is inside and who is outside. Because supporters are the ones in a, the most comfortable position. They're comfortable because in any crisis, in severe crisis, they can stop providing help and change direction. Also, we have allowed support to be weaponized against us. We enable the sub supporters to, de to determine the path. Historically, 1,000 people would give one dinar. Now one person gives 1,000 dinars. No explanation needed. Most of the support they provide is founded on their wishes rather than our actual needs, and these wishes can change suddenly. This is especially true of the general situation for, for cultural institutions, as you know very well, places like the Goethe Institute or the British Council that's aligned with their political and national interests. Over the years, I have seen that very few cultural institutions provide direct support or aid funds to individuals in institutions or outside them. But supporting individuals is a must. It has to be done without expecting anything in return, since the most essential critical elements of our ecology are individuals and the workers. Support is needed, is, is needed not in the sense of inviting them to a temporary residency, shelter, or an artist at risk program. However, these are also essential because they exist and they are indispensable. The actors in the ecology include installers, painters, assistants, translators, editors, designers, and a host of other people. Precarious work is the majority. If an, but if an ecosystem exists, it must be for all of us. As I said, supporters do not share responsibility. So we have to think of the distance between the supporter and the recipient. Because funding is not merely giving money, it's taking responsibility. If this is none, we cannot discuss a consistent ecology. I'm not debating mentoring programs in normal situations or European cultural management prescriptions or networking activities. I hate the word networking. We have little to learn from Western Europe because we do not come from the same experiences or shared histories, including the history of the public. If we'll be in trouble, we should be in trouble altogether. Using also opacity as a tool is critical. We must consider the cultural and artistic environment as a refuge and protection that the disenfranchised, marginalized, or targeted communities can trust. In this sense, I use, I use, the, fermenta I use the term fermentation quite a bit. Just as museums protect artifacts and research institutions protect archives and knowledge. People, discourses and discussions must also be protected. Art and cultural institutions must be pioneers among those that stand against aggressive nationalism, populist discourses, discourses and discreditation. 
I'm not talking about demonstrating, but representing or proposing different values. Can our practices through solidarity projects become part of a broader political and activist community? How will collaboration, sharing, and solidarity be realized? But first, there has to be a reason for solidarity. We cannot just say solidarity is good. It's not a slogan. It's not enough to say cooperation is good or visual culture is good. We have to accept from the beginning that there will be contradictions between us because conformity is frightening. Togetherness should not resemble a cult. We need to focus on complex issues instead of skirting around them. An internalized critical art criticality is necessary. Many institutions may think that their existence is enough, but why? Because they deal with culture and art, why is art good? Because it is. Is this sufficient reasoning? No. Organizations everywhere, not just those accustomed to crisis conditions, need to think about how they operate in times of crisis, like now. For example, how did the August 4 explosion, which almost destroyed Beirut's cultural life, affect the cultural actors, the Syrians, who were one in four people in Beirut. But funds could not be distributed to Syrian cultural producers. How did we get, get around these problems? So what are the ways to share resources, build a relationship network, and organize dif different discussions? Both lawyers and bankers can participate in these discussions. This will help individuals and organizations develop new behaviors for their survival. And we should not look negatively at not-profit institutions developing models to generate income, different models to generate income, because we cannot be stuck be between the foundation model and the donor model. As long as these mechanisms do not allow the revenue generated to serve personal interest, when asking questions and drawing possible scenarios, we should remember that art practices differ. In other words, for art to be practical, it should not be instrumentalized. And this is the radical difference that dis distinguishes art from other life activities. A better idea, as my good colleague Manolo Boravie says, create this community of love that connects to art on an emotional level. I know I have taxed your time, but I want to end with um, young Cassius speaking about Wilhelm Sandberg, whose practice at the Stedelijk Museum in the 1950s and 60s profoundly influenced me. Here's Cassius on Sandberg, I'm quoting now. What interest Sandberg is changing the world? It is in that perspective that he views art in its creation. He makes a distinction, distinction between artists and those who practice art. The latter is essential to every culture. But the artist is the person who shows us a world different from the one we know. The true artist Sandberg believes does not offer us another world into which we can escape. She shows us that the other world where we shall live in the Stedelijk Museum, Sandberg considered his duty considered, considered it his duty to provide true artists with the space in which to exhibit their work, to enable them to inform as many people as possible on what was going in the world rather than in art. Thank you for coming, allowing me to share my thoughts with you. Thank you. Is there any surprising of anything that you said on the political system, the art system, the educational system? See what happened in Harvard, what happened in the University of Pennsylvania. This is the pocket that's running the world. Unfortunately, the money is in the wrong pockets. It's a corrupt individual, Jewish Zionist group, and right-wing group. And unless we create a parallel system to fight them, unfortunately, the people who have money in the Middle East and the Islamic world are worse and more corrupt than the group that we have in the United States and Western Europe. 
So I'm really not sure where we're going to go from here because it is it is so depressing when you see all these people dying and people are debating, is this this or that? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I, I happen to, of course, I happen to agree with <laughs> With with uh, with what you're saying, at, at, at I mean regarding regarding the boards of museums and boards of cultural institutions and all of that, in especially in the states, that but it could have been another religious group, it could have been another kind of business because it's the system that's corrupt. As you, the system doesn't work. We have what moved for billion dollars and Muslims that are not able to do change well he in the skirt I guess well it was not make any sense uh, and we will it's not the... because this is another power that could actually see the one about how the, you know instead of having a museum you written for a civil war to show his art this can be done with we get it you know that other but instead of show movies nonsense of dancing wall whatever to so be I mean, to be truthful, over the last 20 years, uh, I have, maybe I, I'm going to say, I may be saying something wrong. Just correct me. You know, it's much better. It's just that uh, there is massive progress in the region in terms of uh, creating different sorts of, I mean, trying to create different sorts of institutions, put scholarship, protect archives, uh, you know, because the Gulf we imagined as a, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll speak from experience. I don't know if it will make any sense, but um, uh, when the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project started, I, Suha did not join us, but I mean, she joined once Peace to, to the meeting that I was not in actually in London because I was, I know that was, that did not end well with the Zionist curator. Um, I was at the time looking at the Gulf as the safe space, you know, I mean, safety from immediate wars, uh, safety, uh, respite, and, and a place that can protect things in, in the sense that this could be the common depository of the whole region where things at risk, people at risk can, uh, you know, can seek shelter and whatnot. But the way I think the way these institutions, these new institutions are organized, uh, are following models that don't actually work anymore. You know, I mean, I, I don't understand why we have to build museums in the 21st century, for example. You know, I mean, it could still be called a museum, but it would operate completely differently. It's, it's, hmm? in, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're following models that do not work. And I, I, it's, it's an inferiority complex, perhaps, you know. I've seen it there. I want it at home as well, you know. But I want it better and bigger, and I want better architect and shinier building, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, at the same time, producing the same models, such as, like, a department of design, a department of painting, or whatever, you know. I mean, life is not organized in departments. Artists are not organized in departments and all of that stuff. I mean, why do we follow? Okay, they don't only follow models that are actually not working, but they also they're also um, importing the kind of uh, professionals that are there for the money and for the short term and for personal gain and whatnot. I mean, if we can build a different kind of ecology, it will work. And we don't need so much money. I, that's Money is almost like, I mean, I talked, I know I talked a lot about funding and et cetera, but it is secondary. It's not the fundamental thing. And plus, I mean, of course, sorry. Yeah, plus, I mean, it, 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 using funding the same in the same way it has been uh, done and following the Euro-American model again is not going to work for different geographies, you know. So we, 
we're kind of you know putting ourselves uh, ourselves in a trap. But I mean, I'm I'm watching all these institutions from a distance and 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 Doha from you know a bit closer. It's like I'm sorry, but why don't we? Why do we need the Brits? I'm sorry, you know. Why do we need five more Americans who are like you know either retired or whatever? And why? Why? You know? Why don't we build? Why don't we build from inside out? You know? It's the whole mind shift has to I mean, the whole mind has to shift. But I understand, you know, because they don't actually want. Uh, they're not actually building uh, interested in building communities. They're more interested in tourism and and competition between each other. You know, who's going to make the best, big, biggest museum and et cetera, et cetera. Who's going to pour more funds into it? Uh, and this lesson is not being. Uh, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I don't think this model is uh, is very viable. You know, any other like example you can speak of? Because I just be like um, embedded in cultures most of the time. So he informed it and the way they learn is using it. It's very much like an actor or he, I mean, just showing, um, in Savias, I mean, like just like that, well, that was about, uh, are doing that the accessories of, uh, having more and more and different sizes and all these kind of things. But outside that, what would you look at? I mean, you know, an app. I would look. I will look to smaller institutions, smaller places, initiatives, molecular, molecular ones uh, that really uh, feed the community and and are, are are built around community. It's just the question is how to, you know, uh, how to make life easier for them. Yeah. All all this is uh, very true, but the, the issue now is not a problem of system of. Uh, uh, funding of uh, what has been happily. The issue now for us, particularly in our area, is an issue of survival. It's an issue of what are we going to do while everything we believe in, everything we, be, we do has been destroyed. You have this list of artists uh, who are uh, uh, cancelled, who are uh, uh, even, uh, you know, harassed. And uh, we have examples, and you and Emily Jasser here, who shot her film and who has been forbidden to, uh, to, to talk or the her. So the issue, we all know the situation, and this list is going on and on and on. What I'm asking and what I would like you to tell me, what can we do? What can we do? We, uh, enough speaking about, uh, you know, all the corruption and all the things and and what the government are doing or not doing. What is, how can we break this horrible silence? You know, in, in the States, the killing is happening in Gaza and in Palestine. And I don't speak politics, but I'm going to speak politics. Mr. Biden is sitting. They have the right of self-defense. Us as people, as an old generation who try to change things, what can we tell the new generation what to do to be able to have hope and to do something to break this? I don't know if uh, your experience. Actually, the new generation is a, you know, a group that is giving us hope because the only group that, and as he said, it, if they rather see the mules are the air ones. Well, I think they will first start killing us. I, I think the... the yeah, I think the next the next war is between between this very young generation and us, because we didn't. I mean, you we. I mean, I kept saying this, but we, I think we left. We are leaving them a much worse world than the one we in, than we took from our parents. We are. We have no excuse. Yeah, I mean, we're not. Um, I wanted to ask you in the beginning of the, your talk, you were talking about um, unnecessary controversy in art. So what to, what to you is unnecessary controversy and what is necessary controversy in art? Um, great question. I, mean, I believe that the, the art institution 
the kind of public space it constructs has to be inclusive first, you know. And this inclusivity is a very complicated question, you know. Uh, sometimes contemporary art is, you know, push may push you away. Uh, sometimes you are, as an institutional practice, you would you would be ultra secularist. Sometimes uh, you, uh, sometimes you're not uh, aware of the diversity of the society. You only speak to one part, and forget about the you know forget about the others. So, and and your and this cannot be done with ex you know you cannot make everybody happy. This this you have to know. I mean we are not we are not here to make people happy. You know, we are here to start a discussion, but that discussion itself has to be done in a way that will not leave people out, you know. So, and this is, this is kind of, this isn't, this is not an easy, easy thing to do. I, uh, I know, uh, but I mean, from like with my institution is in Istanbul, that when I used to work, uh, we had more uh, covered Muslim women than any other institution. But I did it in very simple, like almost banal ways. For example, uh, I ordered all my security staff to never follow anyone. Because if you're going as a first timer to, into an institution uh, and you know you feel uneasy, you think that like cultural institution is not for me, you know, it may be the case. So if you f if you follow people, if you start profiling people, if you're suspicious of people who are coming into the institution, you've already lost the game. You know, first you have to create this comfort. You know, that you know you are welcome. You know, I mean, so it, it's just like policy after policy, like this. Uh, also, I you know I I change my staff because. The regular uh, stuff is, I mean, in Turkey, I'm talking about Turkey, of course, it's, uh, clean family machines, uh, white Turks, uh, well-to-do, coming from well-to-do families who send their children to, you know, uh, blah, blah, and they come back and they don't actually need money, you know, so they, you know, move into the cultural sector, which is fine. I mean, that's what the, that's what art institutions have been built on for since the 19th century. Uh, but you can't do that alone because your even your staff itself have to be diversified because you cannot know how you know you cannot know these things you know I mean I have a singular viewpoint and not, you know, so th that has to be diversified and all of that and and it 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 worked and because of our sensitivity to to these contexts etc etc you know so it's not like self censoring but it's not being one, it's not being arrogant. It's really not talking down to people. It's not preaching. It's, you know, trying to work through a problem together. At the end of the day, it may not work, but it's our job to, you know, to create that context in which people come together. Because this is, I mean, the art institution is the only people, is the only place where people come together these days, other than malls, you know. There's no other space left, you know. So that's, I think that's critical too, for the spaces, I mean, for the institution itself to adapt to a different mentality altogether, exhibitions, but also structurally. Yeah. Uh, uh, هو لغة عالمية إلا أن الاحتراما لأهل غزة وفلسطين الذين يعبرون عن آلامهم بهذه اللغة سأتحدث بالعربية ترجم له أني أنا احتراما لأهل غزة وفلسطين راح تكون مداخلتي بالعربية ماشي ماشي شكرا لمؤسسة خالد شومان على ما تقوم به الدور الذي تقوم به
آه شكرا فاسف على ما قدمت آه في هذه الأمسية آه قضية فلسطين آه هي قضية آه إنسانية لا تحتاج أن تكون عربي آه كي تشعر بما يحدث بفلسطين فأنت لا تحتاج لأكثر من أن تكون إنسان كي يهزك هذا العدوان هذا العدوان الذي يأبى الصادق فيه أن يسوي بين الضحية والجلاد واحتل وجلاد الأرض وغاصبها منذ البدايات اليوم أعتقد أنه يجب علينا أن نكون على قيد شعور بما يحدث ما رأيناه في العالم كله وفي دول الغرب بالتحديد حيث خرجت المظاهرات بمئات الآلاف يؤكد على أن ما يحدث الآن هو يخز كل إنسان الفن اليوم هو أحد الوسائل التي يمكن لنا أن نستغلها في إيصال هذه الحالة العالمية والتركيز على هذا الجانب الفن بكل أشكاله ودعم هذا هذا هذه النقطة أو الفن في إيصال هذه القضية لكل الناس أتابع أيوة لكن سؤالي الآن بالنسبة لل المنظمات او منظمات المجتمع العربي في في البلدان العربيه خليني انا اقول دورها الذي راينا انه في هذه المرحله لم يكن كما يجب الكثير من المؤسسات اللي بتعمل في البلاد العربيه حتى انها حضرت على موظفيها الخروج والتعبير عما يحدث في غزه وفلسطين شكرا Now, I mean, I don't have any answers to that, but I, uh, I, yeah, it's, I mean, for example, like Turkey is a, supports the cause in a very vocal way, yeah, throughout president and et cetera, et cetera. But in the back, they have amazing business interests in Israel. I I, th I find that shameless, you know? I mean, you, Parasia is like, you you know, you cannot speak the truth. You also have to exercise it. You know, we, these, these two, one without the other cannot happen. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't know of it because the severity of the situation does not call for being neutral or modest about what you're saying. Yeah. It's not. Not anymore. Yeah. This, yeah, I mean, you know, it can't be generalized into a human crisis. I mean, this it's not that. Not at all. Yeah, I agree. Oh, once. The day. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for the input. I have a very practical question. There was some uh, little triggery point you mentioned uh, about the security workers in the museums and art institution who you wish uh, be more welcoming when I understood you right. I had to think about the exhibition I was working on. It was Marina Abramovic retrospective, and we were, as a performance artist, we were uh, naked all the time. And there was this exhibition traveled from one country to another, from Scandinavia all the way to Belgrade to Serbia. And now I thought about it because you mentioned it. It's very interesting how the secure how the institutional approach to security would differ from one to another in Germany. Security people were former military, men, women mixed. There was Russian guy, security guard, who was very proud to show me his gun he was carrying. In his, and he was kind of looking forward to use it. And it was an art exhibition, a performance art exhibition. Then in Italy, securities were actually young girls. 
uh, who just looked very pretty and had to look pretty. The director and the manager, they were forcing them to put makeup on and to look extra pretty and they didn't even care if they had first aid course or anything, you know. And this was security guards. And then in Belgrade, these were mostly retired people who got like nothing paid for this job. Also, we as performance artists got really underpaid. So it was really different in every institution. And in this particular exhibition, at least, the security part was very important because we were, you know, naked and stuff. And there were people who were angry at us and so on. Conservative people who would come to exhibition. There was one person who hit me just like this, you know, with her elbow. And there was no security guard who would stop her from this, you know. So for me, the question would be like how to combine the institution to be feeling welcoming to you and, you know, uh, where you feel you don't, you're not observed all the time. At the same time, how to uh, reassure the security of, of this place, you know, because people come, you never know where they come from to this exhibition, what they're on their mind and so on. I mean, it's, I, I don't know about the others. I, I had, I had my own practice so I trained my security because I thought this was absolutely essential especially in a culture which is not a museum culture which is not an exhibition going or museum going culture that that they had to be extremely properly trained and we went through a lot of people doing that but at the at the end of the day they all learned how to do this it's yeah, it's, pro it's, it's problematic, it's, it's, I mean, usually, you know, because, you know, we curators, artists, we, you know, we do the show, we go, uh, curators come down to their exhibitions once in a while, but they, they're not really on the ground all the time. Um, whereas, like, security is the first person and the last person you see in the institution all the time. So it's it's the face of the institution, you know, it, it's what defines the level of hospitality and all of that so it's it's quite critical i think that they you know and plus it's good for the security as well they're you know they understand that their role is different from a classical security position yeah no yeah. i think so i'm probably i know them thank you